disappointment runs in my life because look, hi. <laughs> I am going to talk about uh, a series I don't talk about very often here on Chatty Faces or on the channel in general. It's actually revolving around a series that belongs to Atari, created by Chris Sawyer back in 1998. Good. Eight. Something like that. Rollercoaster Tycoon. Hey. Yeah. Could have said Micro Machines World Series, but I've said that enough. Um, when the Tycoon games sort of stopped in 2004 with Tycoon 3, we didn't get anything for like five years five, six years, and it was like, hey, you want a new game? Here's 4 Mobile. Tycoon 4 Mobile. They punned it in the title with the sequel, and it was bad. And then they said, hey, let's put it on the uh, 3DS. Also bad. And then they went, okay, finally, we're going to do Roller Coaster Tycoon 5-ish for PC. Back to the roots of the series. And, you know, for somebody who loves those games and having like a solid 10 years without a new game in that genre that, I, that isn't absolute dog shit, it was exciting. I remember seeing the, the, the first trailer just a lift hill, like, hey, we're making a new game. It's all really exciting. And then, you know, a year or so later, Frontier Developments turn around and go, hey, we're making Planet Coaster. And it's like, cool. Don't need to, to give you any more information on that and my relationship with that game. Uh, and Atari went, oh crap, uh, mm, there, here you go, here, here's Tycoon World. And literally the trailers, it was like um, looking at Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, like when that trailer first came out and everyone just kind of went, uh, mm, 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 mm. Because the game looked like ass. It looked worse than Tycoon 3 and that was 2004. The gameplay was absolutely terrible. The game ran like ass, and it went through like five different developers before it got to finally being released, which they released the day after Planet Coaster, with which they revealed the release date of the game after Planet Coaster revealed their release date. Because they were like, oh no, we need to try and jump, we need to try and get a, a, a leg up over Plan Co, and pff, it wasn't gonna work. But Tycoon World is just the biggest mess of a game, and it's it's probably the furthest I've ever seen a game franchise fall. Like, it's it's genuinely disappointing to see this incredible series that Chris Sawyer still has stake in. He still owns that license. He, he owns the franchise. It's still his. It doesn't belong to Atari. They have publishing rights. And he's worked on Tycoon Classic, which is fantastic. Um, but seeing a new game, like, like a, the plan co of the original Tycoon series, be such an absolute catastrophic fuck up. It's, it's genuinely depressing. Is and that the last one as well? That is, uh, you, they've done a bunch of, Atari have done a bunch of uh, newer games so that are like console versions of the games. They've just released Adventures for the Switch, which if you go back and plug, 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 watch my video on the uh, Whatever Happened to Roller Coaster Tycoon, um, Atari were like, hey, you know us. We're Atari, we made all this stuff. And it's like, well, that wasn't you, was it? You've just, you've just another company with their name. But anyway, they were like, hey, crowdfund this game that we want to make but no one cares about it anymore because you've killed the franchise and they've just they've been trying to trying their best to keep the nostalgia factor from like the early noughties late 90s in but uh, they've completely killed the series so Tycoon World is such a colossal disappointment well I've talked about Mass Effect 3 so much that I'm not going to talk about Mass Effect 3 again but it clearly is that um, although other things that come to mind um, it's it's going to be and this is this is a wound this because it shouldn't it shouldn't be this um, but it's Hellblade send you a sacrifice um, because I w always want to love Ninja Theory I love what they bring to the industry and I love I remember when Enslaved Odyssey to the West came out in 2010 um, which was another massive disappointment for me because um, they have everything lined up in their favour they've got Andy Serkis on board they pioneered this amazing motion capture technology for their faces and everything um, and the story is great this post-apocalyptic thing in Enslaved um, and for me the gameplay just it just wasn't it was weirdly repetitive, the combat didn't really have any weight to it, it just kind of was a bit eh. But then in the run-up to Hellblade, it was like, cool, you're, like, what they're proving to the industry is that they can do a AAA looking game with gorgeous graphics on an indie budget. That was the whole like mission statement for that game. Um, and it looks amazing, like, you know, the photo mode in it is brilliant. I love the idea of um, just taking Senua herself and exploring psychosis and different mental states through the game itself. Um, fantastic. Like, the general premise of it, absolutely brilliant. And I love that Senua herself is played by Melissa Jurgens, who was just one of their, um, like, video editors or someone that worked in the office and was like, oh no, I can do this, like I feel like I'm up to the task. And her performance is phenomenal in it. Um, and all these elements should have made for one of the best games of all time, and to some people I know that it totally is. Um, but for me, it was the fact that they lean on the same, literally the exact same puzzle over and over and over again in that game. Um, and you've already got combat that's quite basic anyway, but like because you have this amazing story that you just 
want to delve into and pick apart why what happened to Senua and her history and the whole history of her clan and everything. And you keep going back to this exact same puzzle where it's just find three things in the environment. They could be anywhere, just go find them. And they're just visual things that you have to rotate the camera to look at, like line up certain things or whatever. And I just couldn't, I'm watching it, playing it, I couldn't believe they kept doing that for the whole game. Um, and I just I just wanted to love it so much and cherish it. But every, every turn, it, threw, it just stopped the story dead and just said, hey, go find three more runes. They're somewhere. And I just remember just sitting there, like just literally with this kind of face being like, Are you li is this literally what you've got? Um, and that infuriated me. And so like, I've never really shifted that. I always thought that Hellbit is this amazing, ambitious thing, but I hate the design of it, the overall gameplay design of it. Um, and I never really got past that. So if it's personal disappointment, it's that, because that game should be up there. That game should be one of the, should be heralded as one of the greatest games of all time um, with one of the purest intentions behind it. But oh dear Lord, the gameplay of it is horrific. Well, my life is a perpetual roller coaster of disappointment. You'll know a lot about them personally. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just just thinking about a couple of ones that sort of saddened me when they came out. I, I don't like to criticise the fine folk at Playtonic because I think they're doing excellent work trying to revive a genre that's gone by the wayside. Uh, but ultimately, Ukulele didn't quite deliver on the promise to bring back the magic of Banjo because in the end, sort of like the bad parts of Banjo Tui, you know, the, uh, the, the, the big tedious levels and the the lack of focus and basically just a lot of fanning about. But but it's still it's still pretty good. It sort of gets somewhere up to what it's doing. But one game that really I, I think really didn't deliver on its promise was a game that I spent a lot of the lead up to the PlayStation 3's release uh, like genuinely excited about possibly the last game I was legitimately looking forward to and that was David Cage's Jason Sim Heavy Rain. So David Cage promised this game would change the way narratives were delivered in games. He said every single choice would have an impact on the way the story went. The whole story would weave organically around every minute de decision. If you choose to pick up a box in a shop, for example, you might fail to spot a shoplifter and fail a sequence and not have a, a concatenating effect, like a domino effect later in the game. And to an extent, it does do that, but mostly it's just a series of very strict branches along a tree, much in the same way as Fahrenheit. But unfortunately, also in the same way as Fahrenheit, it had a quite terrible script, which could have greatly benefited from an editor, in much the same way we say as Hideo Kojima, I think that applies to David Cage 100%. It had a female character who existed purely for titillation, she contributed nothing to the plot other than that, which felt quite, honestly, quite sexist. Um, you had another character whose motivations changed completely when you learned the big mid-game reveal, which I can't, I won't say, but it just doesn't make sense if you go back through it. Um, and yeah, ultimately it just, it just underwhelmed. Uh, the, the characters didn't feel quite human enough to justify this high level concept. Before Battle Royale was a thing, there was this one game called The Culling. Now you might have heard of it before, like there was um, a massive controversy about it last year, um, about The Culling 2, where it just became a rip off of everything that there is nowadays. Um, and it only lasted pretty much one day on Steam. But the precursor to that, which was The Culling, was a much, much better game overall. Um, it came out in early access in 2016. And it's a bit weird like to think about it, like three years ago there was the whole Battle Royale boom, but um, it feels like it was about like 10, 5 years ago or something like that. Um, but anyway, this game was like absolutely revolutionary, it was uh, like, it was genuinely going to be like the biggest Battle Royale game if it was still around today. Um, like it could have been better than PUBG in a way, uh, maybe it's not as good, but but it still needed like a lot of polish when it was in early access essentially. But the whole thing was you, so you start off in this map and it's literally like Hunger Games, you have a predetermined place and you can craft wood and get, gather rocks to make bows, spears, arrows, all that, all that kind of stuff. It was really, really fair. The combat system was pro is probably the best in any game I've ever seen in a battle royale essentially. You've got uh, just like your normal attacks, you've got the block and you've got shoves and now it's like a paper, uh, rock paper scissors system where you can shove someone who's blocking and they get stunned or you can block someone's attack and they get stunned. And also what you can do as well is throw your weapon which is really cool. Uh, I haven't seen that in a battle royale game before but the reason why it's so disappointing, like I know it's all great and all that, but 
it's because of the developers once again. Like they made loads and loads of hot fixes and, and patches and changes and nerfs to like weapons and all the perks and everything like that in the game, which made it looks, which made it really good. Um, and eventually the play base just dwindled down to 10 people per day and it's um, easy to see why the player base just hated it because they were sick of all these changes. Um, I mean there were like some changes that needed to be addressed like one of them was a taser which you could like stock up on like 10 or so tasers and you could stun someone for 20 seconds um, at end game pretty much killing them instantly. My expectation of it was to be polished up, be brought out into like you know out of early access and become an amazing game but it just just wasn't it just became a massive disappointment in a way most disappointing game of the decade is actually one that technically doesn't exist and that's uh, fable legends i was lucky enough to go and play it way back in the day when i went to gamescom in 2015 i think it was got to play a little hands-on demo of it, and I was like, this is actually brilliant. This might actually change my entire perception of Peter Molyneux, father of all lies, and it would actually like be the best game, and he could actually hype it up, and I'd be like, yes, Peter, you're right for once. But unfortunately, it was not to be because it was cut. Don't know the full story as to why, but they were just like, nah, people don't want a, um, what's it called when you've got um, a, a 4v1? There's a word for asymmetrical. it. Asymmetrical. Asymmetrical. Uh, no one wants to have an asymmetrical hero fighter just when like games like Evolve were coming out and Overwatch was starting to popularize the hero aspect of like shooting stuff you like. That was the perfect time to release it, you idiots. But the concept of the game was you could choose up to four heroes and one of you was this evil mastermind dungeon keeper style thing that had a different view of the entire map and he could put in things like hedges would just pop out of the ground or summon in enemies and traps and just basically it was their job to grief you until you got to the end of the level. They would never really win because it was definitely weighted in the side of the heroes but as a person whose job it was just to annoy people I was like oh, I resonate very well with this so yeah but I was just disappointed because it's never come to be and now apparently we're going to get Fable 4 with none of those elements from it so cool beans thanks first I need to uh, make one thing clear Ash isn't around is she I don't think so it's Aliens Colonial Marines because that it is, isn't it? piece of crap is one of the worst things ever and the most disappointed I've been and actually marks quite a personal shift in my life towards the point where I just couldn't get excited about everything and then nothing was good and everything was bad and there was a shift in culture after Aliens Colonial Marines came out where the childhood that I was clinging on to was obliterated because this game, I think it was announced back in 2008, and I remember reading about it in a magazine and seeing the screen grabs and being so excited about it because the Aliens franchise was something I loved as a kid growing up. I even loved Alien Resurrection because I was a big, dumb, idiot child. And obviously I was looking forward to this movie because the people at Gearbox were saying that it was going to be a faithful, you know, continuation of the story. It was bringing back characters. It was going to do this franchise justice. And I just wanted a game that would do it justice. And back in the day, I didn't really know how games were put together, but I knew this looked stunning and I knew the graphics looked amazing. And I was just, you know, spent years thinking about what this game could be. And then the years went on and then the game didn't come out. And then it was 2013 and it was five years later and the game finally had a release date. And I thought, brilliant, champion. This um, has got a lot of bad omens attached to it, but it's Aliens Colonial Marines and I can't be disappointed on this level, can I? Can I? I could, I really could because then it came out and it was obviously a complete disaster and they told a few fibs in the marketing where you know things didn't line up, it wasn't the game you were sold, apparently Gearbox didn't even really care about it, they outsourced allegedly most of the work to other studios while they were working on Borderlands 2 and you feel that in every element of the game and it was so bad that when the reactions first came out I didn't even play it for about a year or two afterwards because I couldn't bring myself to pay a full price for this thing, this thing that I had birthed from an egg. So then I bought it for five pounds in a second hand shop and then played it. It was still disappointed because every penny was going by on the screen and I was thinking about the other things I could have bought with that, like a Big Mac meal, like two bottles of Coca-Cola, like a bus trip to a dump site where I could throw the box into a fire and then set it on fire. That's what they have then. Pound for matches, a 
couple of pounds for some kerosene, some wood. I could have bought a nice little fire pit to throw this disc into and then scrub it from history or at least my memory. And now I think about it sometimes when I go to sleep and it reminds me that, you know, sometimes just things don't go your way and everything will be bad when they don't.